Well, good morning, friends. Happy uh, Sunday. I'm so happy to be together again this morning. I've been looking forward to this all week. Um, I'll remind you that we are still celebrating the resurrection this morning. Um, I want y'all to remember this morning that life, um, new life is possible, that we can receive that power of Christ's resurrection to empower us to continue loving God and loving others, even in the midst of madness. This is Sunday. This is a day to celebrate, um, even in the midst of, of difficulties and, and challenges and struggles, um, we still come together to celebrate because we have reason to celebrate. Jesus rose from the dead, and that means that we too can rise up and overcome the things that tear us down. This morning, we're going to be reminded that our God is always greater, that he's greater than all things, greater than the big and scary things. God is always greater, and that is one reason why we worship and praise God, is to remind ourselves that God is always greater. Uh, My name is John Gallagher, and I'm the pastor at Embrace Church, and I just want to welcome you guys to our uh, time of worship and fellowship this morning. Um, If you could share uh, this um, video on your live stream or on your timeline, that would be awesome. Um, That way you can, you know, connect other people to what we're doing. You can just hit down at the bottom, share, then write a short post and, and throw that out there, and you never know who might see it and want to join up with us this morning. Um, also invite people, you know, like during your week, if you know other people who are at home, say, hey, my church is doing this thing and it's encouraging to me. Um, I'd like you to check it out and be a part of it with us. So um, feel free to invite others this week to join us uh, for what we do each Sunday. So to begin, what we're going to do is sing together. And so I encourage you wherever you're at uh, to kind of get your space ready Um, I I like to kind of light candles, to get focused, to turn off any distractions um, so that we can truly connect with God and connect with one another. I'll also remind you that we are going to have communion. Um, We started doing it every single week now, and so get ready for that. Uh, We'll be sharing communion at the end of our our service, and so sometime between now um, and then go ahead and get your stuff ready and make sure you're prepared for that. But let's begin by worshiping God this morning. Uh, Chris and Christina are going to lead us um, in some songs. Never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let me down. 
Amen. Amen. What a simple but powerful song. I want to read um, our psalm for this morning. It's one that we all know really well, I'm sure, that, that many of you have heard. Um, but it's a very uh, just powerful reminder for us that, that God is our shepherd, that God looks after us, that God cares for us. So, so hear these words. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, your goodness and your love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Again, my name is John Gallagher, and I am the, uh, one of the pastors here at Embrace. If you've never attended Embrace uh, with us before, then I want to give you a special uh, welcome and shout out this morning. I'm so happy that you chose to connect with us uh, through our Facebook Live worship. Um, if you're worshiping with us this morning, it doesn't matter if you've ever been inside of our building or never met any of us. You're part of our family this morning. Um, I also want to give a special shout out to our children. Uh, we have many children um, and youth who are tuning in uh, from all across the, the, the world even. And I just want to say that we are missing you, that we love you. You bring so much joy to our church and I've really loved having you guys interact and share things with us through the comments as we go throughout our worship service. A few quick things. Um, like I said at the beginning, if you don't mind sharing this video on your timelines, um, I'm telling you that people have been connected with our church just through you sharing it. Um, somehow the, the word gets out, uh, and Facebook loves when people share things. So we're going to uh, use that and, and share it with folks to make sure that people know what we're doing and can connect with the Embrace family if they need that. Um, also, comment as much as you want, participate. Um, it's really nice when uh, you guys do kind of fill up our content or our comments with just wonderful life and energy and love and honesty and vulnerability. Um, it's, it's a really beautiful thing and it encourages me and helps me just feel closer to you all and to God when I leave uh, here on Sunday mornings. Also, we have our Tuesday and Thursday check-ins each week. Uh, these are time for connection and sharing with one another at noon, and so I encourage you to tune in at noon. You never know what you're going to get. Um, we, we may have somebody else sharing, um, but Christina or, or myself will always be there to kind of facilitate it, um, but there's a lot of good stuff on those. So if you haven't watched any of them, you can go back and watch all of that stuff. So if you're bored, just throw it on while you're washing dishes or whatever you may be doing and, and hear kind of some of the good things that are happening um, in our community. I'll also remind you that we're going to share communion together this morning. So whatever food, whatever drink that you have chosen to kind of be uh, your communion elements through this season of social distancing, um, go ahead and get that ready. And, and I encourage you, even before church, to get it ready beforehand. If you forgot this morning, that's okay. Just do it now and, and make sure we're ready. You know, this distance has been painful for us and it's been difficult and a lot of Folks have shared, we really need communion. We want this. This is life-sustaining for us. And so we're going to do it. And I know this is not necessarily the best way to share communion because it's really good to be in the same room. But, you know, Jesus' presence and his love are not limited by social distancing or a global pandemic or anything else for that matter. Um, Jesus can meet you right where you're at. And so um, we'll do that after the sermon this morning. Um, also, if you're able to continue giving financially, uh, to our church, then then that would be great. I'm going to throw on the link um, so that you'll know how to do that if you uh, are able to. Um, I want to just say thank you so much uh, to those of you who have just given faithfully, um, whether it's you know given a little bit or a lot. It's just been awesome to see the generosity that you guys have shown through all this because I know that like this is a very anxious time for many people. And, and it's been so encouraging to me and to Christina and to the other leaders to see that, that our church is digging in, that we're supporting the work um, so that we can continue doing what we're doing. And, and it's awesome. And I just feel so um, 
awesome just to be part of a church uh, that that is willing to kind of dig in and, and make this happen, um, even in the midst of hard times. So thank you so much for that. Um, you can also send checks in the mail. Um, we'll be glad to to do that. We're, we're here in the office on a regular basis and taking deposits to the bank and all that kind of thing. So you can send us stuff in the mail as well and it will get to us. Um, what I'd like to do now is just take a few moments to share some things that we're grateful for. Uh, we do this every week and I think it's particularly important for us to do this when we're going through hard times uh, because we need to remind ourselves that we do have a lot to be grateful for even when life is difficult. And so go ahead, uh, type out what you're grateful for. Um, our young people, our kids, um, I'd love to hear uh, what you all are grateful for as well. And so tell your parents or whoever you're with, or you take the phone and type it out yourself. Um, but type out what you're grateful for um, and share it with the group. And I'll just highlight a few of these just to kind of bring some of that positive, good energy into our space and our worship time together. Um, and, and so we can like build each other up too. This is just a really awesome thing that we get to do. And so what are we grateful for this morning? Let's share some stuff. Um, I was grateful this morning to, to wake up and just be beautiful weather. And I got to go outside for a little bit, open my back window and I feel like the birds are just off the hook right now. They're everywhere and they're, they're, they're just like singing songs to me in the morning. And, and that was a really just special time to, to do that this morning. So what are some other things that we're grateful for? Rob is grateful for beautiful weather. Um, Dan is grateful for the walks that he's had with friends uh, while being able to maintain distance at the same time. Zoe Epley is thankful for painting. Elijah Epley is grateful for good weather. Um, two of our, our youth in our church. Uh, Kathy Bolton is grateful for every day of her life. Amen. Um, Julie Duff, grateful for modern medicine. Unexpected but joyous weekend with her nephew uh, for water, for rock. Um, Raylan, uh, one of our our young our kids is grateful that she's healthy. Drayton, another one of our, our kids, is grateful that his birthday is coming soon, uh, which will be near the end of the month. He's been counting down the days for, for weeks now. Uh, Leandra is grateful, or Alex actually, is grateful that his wife, Leandra, is so patient with him. And uh, she said he really did say that. All right. <laughs> Melanie is grateful for our governor and his team and for being, um, and that she's able to be here in Kentucky now. Carol's grateful for sunny days. Um, Rachel Sunder's also grateful for the 70 degree mor mornings. Venus, good to, good to have you all tuning in from far away. Uh, Diane's grateful for health and shelter. Christy Heiler, grateful for the peace that comes from the word when we actually go to it. And, and that's true. Uh, thankful for the message about Gideon uh, this week. Um, Emily John is grateful that... Um, for her husband, Matthew. He's been such a good partner and teammate uh, to go through all this with. John Epley, grateful for family breakfast, picnic in the yard today. Beatrice and Chuck are grateful for some sore muscles from a long day of yard work yesterday. Yeah, that feels good sometimes. Jackie J, uh, for a good week of homeschooling. Um, she gets an A in kindergarten Spanish. All right, good work. Rick Reams, grateful to be worshiping with the church. Uh, my wife, Laura, Grateful for our bike ride at the Legacy Trail yesterday. Um, Kren is grateful for her cat and also being able to go outside because of beautiful weather. Um, Dustin's grateful for all the green. Um, Nate, Nate, good to see you on here. Um, I'm grateful for you and all you've meant to us in our lives. Kathy Connor, grateful for faith and Chuck's home sold uh, to the first people that walked through it. Praise the Lord. Um, Valentine likes my hair, I guess. So thanks, Valentine. It's it's getting long, man. I'm kind of getting a rat tail on the back. It's not looking so good. <laughs> uh, James Wang, grateful for quality time, picnics. Levi, one of our young ones, is grateful for his dinosaur encyclopedia. That sounds a lot of fun. Uh, so much stuff. I I can't even get to all of them, but um, just so many good things. Bill Todd, good to see a family and gardening. He's grateful for. Norian's grateful for con con or conversations with friends. Nate's grateful for friends, families, fiance, a roof over his head, clothes on his back, food in his stomach, a job and life. Tanya, grateful to have a moment to herself to breathe this morning and for a clean kitchen. Awesome. Uh, so many things. Um, 
Paige is always reminding me of my age. Thanks, Paige. I appreciate that. Um, uh, we're going to move on this morning, but it's, it's a lot of fun to see all the, the great things that you guys are sharing. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to spend some time reflecting on our story for our Wonder Room this morning. Um, we're going to keep doing this each week. And so our story this morning is, is kind of a story. It's, it's some teaching that Jesus told about being a shepherd, about sheep, and it's kind of mixing in some different stories that, that Jesus told throughout his ministry. And you may not know this, but this morning is actually a Good Shepherd Sunday, is, is traditionally what this Sunday, the fourth Sunday of Easter, is called. And so um, we're, we're reflecting on Jesus as our Good Shepherd, and, and I think that's a wonderful image. You know, we talk about Jesus as King, which I think is great. Um, shepherd is a, is a little bit different image. And, and I think that that's a great image for us to cling to and to reflect on. And so before we do that, um, I want to make sure we see where we're at on our Wonder Room calendar that we have behind us. This is the whole church year. And so I'm going to move out of the way here and show you. So you'll see the arrow here is pointing towards the fourth uh, white block. And this means that we are in the fourth Sunday of Easter. All right. And so um, the cross represents Easter. And then we're in the fourth Sunday. So we're continuing to celebrate Easter, even though uh, Easter Sunday is, is no longer with us. But we are continuing to celebrate the new life and celebrate resurrection. And so I'm going to uh, play for us our Wonder Room story that Christina is going to share with us. And, and then after that, we'll sing a song and then we'll come back together and share some of our wonderings. So be sure to write those wonderings um, out in the comments. There was once someone who said such amazing things and did such wonderful things that people followed him. They couldn't help it. They wanted to know who he was, so they just had to ask him. Once, when they asked him who he was, he said, I am the Good Shepherd. I know each one of the sheep by name. When I take them from the sheepfold, they follow me. I walk in front of the sheep to show them the way. I show them the way to the good grass, and I show them the way to the cool, still, fresh water. When there are places of danger, I show them how to go through. I count each one as the sheep goes inside. If one of the sheep is missing, I would go anywhere to look for the lost sheep, in the grass, by the water, even in places of danger. And when the lost sheep is found, I would put it on my back, even if it is heavy, and carry it back safely to the sheepfold. When all the sheep are safe inside, I am so happy that I can't be happy just by myself, so I invite all of my friends and we have a great feast. This is the way of the good shepherd, but there are also many ordinary shepherds. When the ordinary shepherd takes the sheep from the sheepfold, he does not always show the way. The sheep wander. When the wolf comes, the ordinary shepherd runs away. But the good shepherd stays between the wolf and the sheep and would even give his life for the sheep so they can come back safely to the sheepfold. I wonder if you have ever been lost. I wonder if you have ever been found. I wonder if the Good Shepherd has ever called your name. What other things are you wondering this morning? What do you notice about this story? Spend some time thinking about it and add your comments in the comment section. We'll spend some time wondering together after this song.
Amen. Amen. So uh, I just want to ask you guys, what are we uh, wondering this morning? What are some things that are kind of on our hearts and minds as we think through this, as we hear and reflect on Jesus being shepherd and, and us being sheep? Um, and, and kind of what, what are y'all wondering? I, I see some that, that y'all have thrown out and, and I'll kind of look at these just for a moment. But go ahead and type some of those out. What are y'all wondering this morning? Stacy wonders why people count sheep to go to sleep. Uh, that's a great question. Not sure if this text answers it, but I like it. Uh, I wonder why I find it so easy to wander from the path the shepherd leads. It's a good one. Stacy, I wonder how the sheep stay safe while waiting for the lost one to return with the shepherd. It's, it's great. It's a great thing to wonder. Um, Jackie J says the teacher's notes for the lesson emphasize the fact that the sheep are left in a pen with an open gate when the good shepherd looks for the one. I keep wondering what that means about free will and our continual choice to follow Jesus. Yeah, we're not, not trapped in there, you know. Um, the, there is a way out probably. So um, that's an interesting thing to bring up, Jackie. Sue, I wonder what dangers God has protected me from that I was not even aware of. Yeah, it's interesting to think about, Sue. Uh, Zane was sharing that Rebecca Johns wonders how far shepherds walked. How many, how many miles were they putting in? You know, how, how far did they walk each day? That's a great question. Jim Pinkston, even when we give up, we are never so lost and alone that God can't find us. I like that. Uh, Dan has nothing to do with the text, Dan. He wonders how Christina hits that high note. Um, it's, it takes a lot of skill um, and practice. Tell, uh, what are there any other wonderings that we have? Julie Duff, I wonder if Jesus gets annoyed at that one sheep that keeps uh, wandering off time after time. Yeah, and, and you might be that one sheep, some of you. And, and I know I've been that sheep plenty of times. It's like, you, does Jesus get annoyed or bothered at that? Um, or does he keep coming after us? Those are cr great things to wonder. Sue, I wonder why I never thought of the importance of being part of a flock. Um, which is the support, the encouragement of community. Yeah, so we talk about being a sheep and Jesus the shepherd, but there is the whole flock that we're part of and, and the sheep fold in that pen. And so, yeah, what does that mean? I wonder what that, that means for us to have that community. And Norian, I wonder why the shepherd carries uh, the lost sheep back. It's an interesting thing to wonder. Yeah, I wonder... Who, who the shepherd that ran away represents, uh, or the, who the sheep that ran away represents, and what is the rest of their story? Yeah, I think that that's a great um, thing to wonder, Clea. Who, what about that sheep who runs away, and, and how are we connected? And Paige thinks that, that that represents all of us, because how many times do we all wander, wander away? Rick, I wonder if the other sheep get mad at the one sheep that gets lost. Yeah, I think that that is probably something that could happen. Um, Nate, there are a lot of things I wonder, but I have faith and believe to know and feel that everything happens for a reason and good things come to people. So Nate, Nate's acknowledging that he w does wonder uh, about things and has questions, but he's trying to have faith. Um, and then embrace, I think that's uh, probably Christina under the disguise of embrace. I wonder if it's because he wants the sheep to feel extra love and compassion uh, from him. Yeah, maybe that's why that he would pick up that sheep and, and carry uh, the sheep home. Maybe the sheep's hurt, you know. Maybe we do a lot of harm to ourselves. Maybe we need to be carried sometimes because we're exhausted and we're tired and we can't keep going. Rob, uh, always think of the prodigal son uh, and the resentful brother. So maybe the resentful brother is similar to the 99 who are back there. Yeah. And, and they're wondering, what, why are you doing this? You know, I've always thought that the, the 99 sheep 
could end up saying things like, well, why are you paying so much attention to that one sheep? You know, don't don't all of us sheep matter, you know? And 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 Jesus is like, nah, the lost sheep matters, and I'm going to spend time seeking out that sheep. I think that that's interesting, Rob. Kathy Connor, I wonder if my joy being found by the shepherd is evident to the flock. If when you return home with the shepherd after you've been lost, isn't the, can the rest of the flock see how joyful you are that you were once lost and now you're found? <laughs> Stacy is wondering why he didn't ride the sheep back. I don't think you can ride sheep very well, Stacy. They may not be able to hold, hold a person up too well. Um, I, Cran is wondering how many sheep that shepherd loses per day. Yeah, how many, how many sheep? Are they getting lost all the time? You know, like that's a great question. Um, Bill is, is and, and, and Kalia is pointing out that, that we could be the sheep who wanders off, but also potentially the shepherd uh, um, talks about the, 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 the good shepherd is the one who sticks with the sheep. Someone who's not a true shepherd is going to flee when trouble comes. Uh, or maybe we could also be a shepherd who goes and searches for lost folks and, and tries to bring them back home. There's so much layer to this story. Um, Bill Todd, he's wondering why he remains patient and continues his search. How long did that take? Um, yeah, so many good things that you guys are, are pointing out. Uh, and I think that these images of sheep and shepherd are all throughout uh, the Gospels. Jesus talks about this a lot. This is a very important image for him. And, and it's important to remember that a parable is a story, and I'm going to talk about this a little later. But a parable is a story that, that they say has compressed thought and compressed meaning, meaning there are a lot of layers to it. And they've been compacted down into this tight little story. But the story has so much meaning and so much we could draw from it. And it's not necessarily a one-for-one one comparison. Well, the sheep are always these people. The lost one's always this person. Jesus is always this thing. Um, there's just so much to, to imagine with it and to dig into. And so um, we're going to do that a little bit this morning and look at our text from John chapter 10. So our theme over the last few weeks has been focused on the story of Jesus. All right, I'm going to throw some text on the screen just so we can think about this. The story of Jesus. All right, and, and I believe that the story of Jesus is the most important story we could ever tell. It has profound impact, or it had profound impact on the first Christians, and it continued uh, to change lives ever since this story of Jesus was first told so many years ago. It was their story, and it is our story. And this story of Jesus has power for us today. And here's a really cool thing. That the story is not over. That the story of Jesus is still being written. Now, you may be like, what? It's already been written. What are you talking about? We have the Bible. Like, Well, here's the way I look at it. Jesus' work isn't done. His work isn't finished. You know, when he died on the cross, the pe- most, almost everybody, potentially every single person, thought the story of Jesus was over. They thought that that, it would, that was the ending. He had died. The movement was done. Jesus' story has been written and he is dead. But then he rose from the dead and, and people were like, hey, y'all, it's not over. He's back. We got to get back to work, right? This is... Jesus is back among us. The story is still going. But then he left again. Uh, Y'all probably know, uh, many of you, at the beginning of of Acts, before Pentecost, Jesus ascended up into heaven. And I think perhaps some thought then, well, I guess he's gone again. So the story of Jesus was good while it lasted, but he's gone. He left us again. The story is done. But then something miraculous happened. And it's what we call Pentecost. And and I'll tell you, you may have not thought of it this way, but on Pentecost, Jesus returned to the people and he never left them again. He told his followers before he was crucified that he would never leave them as orphans, that he would be with them even to the end of the age. Now, they had no idea what he was talking about at that point. And and then he died, and they're like, you did leave us as orphans. You have left us. But the reality is, at Pentecost, what happened is Jesus returned, 
through wind and fire, through the Holy Spirit, descending upon the people and filling them with power and direction and mission. At that point, the story of Jesus continued on through the Holy Spirit working through normal, everyday people. And those first Christians carried on the ministry of Jesus through loving God and loving others. And what happened is, as time passed, new realities emerged, things changed. I mean, the world has shifted and changed so much throughout history, through innovation, through tragedy, through violence, through war, through advancement in science and technology. Things have changed and the world has shifted and new realities continue to emerge. And the true Christians, the followers of Jesus that have been preserved throughout history. There have been a lot of, I would venture to say, potentially fake Christians, Christians who just have the name but don't really care much for Jesus. But the true Christians, the ones who are trying to follow Jesus, have sought to answer this question. And and, and the question is simple. How do we carry on the ministry of Jesus in our current context? What is our part? to play in this story of Jesus, in this new reality in which we find ourselves. So how do we carry on the ministry of Jesus in the context we are in right now, in the here and now? And people have been trying to answer that question for a long time. And people have been very creative and carried on the ministry of Jesus in these beautiful, powerful, creative ways. And and really, that's a question that we've got to answer today, right? I came across this article this week, and it was written by a conservative American evangelical leader. All right, so Christian guy, a prominent person, and and he says a lot in this kind of opinion piece that he writes, and it was widely distributed. And, And one of his arguments was that in our world today, he thinks we need to focus less on morality and character in our leaders, and we need to focus more on practicality in a leader's ability to get things done and kind of push forward um, what he would call this kind of conservative agenda that that he thinks that we need to be championing in our nation. And he was kind of saying this, um, and he he was honest about it, as a justification for supporting our current president in spite of his questionable character and morality at times. And so it was interesting. I'm not going to get into it and debate what he was talking about, but a prominent evangelical Christian leader writes a very long op-ed about how Christians ought to engage with politics in our current situation. And guess what? Jesus, his name, Jesus, was not mentioned one time in the very long article that this person wrote, trying to discern how we as Christians ought to kind of engage politically in our world today. Didn't mention the name of Jesus one time. Now, it's interesting to me and, and, and heartbreaking in a way because Christianity began as the story of Jesus. It began, it, it is called and has been called from the beginning the gospel of Jesus Christ. The first Christians, as I said last week, were called Christ ones. They were the people of the way. And you know what the way was? The way was the way of Jesus. Yet what has happened is so many Christians have taken Jesus out of the story and really created their own religion that has little to do with Jesus. I think what a lot of people practice, particularly in America, is what I would call, and others have called, an American civil religion. It is not based on Jesus anymore. It is kind of taking and pulling some different principles and ideas from Christianity, but it's really a new thing that has been created. And And what has happened is, I don't know if a lot of us are still continuing to carry on the ministry of Jesus, but instead we are carrying on our own kind of thing that we want. And often it's been a quest for power and for comfort and status. You know, I think the question that that prominent evangelical leader was asking is important. How do we as Christians engage politically and publicly in our current reality in America? We need to ask that question and we need to seek answers for that question. Yet that question cannot be answered without Jesus being at the center of the conversation. 
It cannot, because as Christians, Jesus has to be at the center. Our entire faith is built on Jesus. So, in our new reality of COVID-19, our reality of wealth disparity in our world, of racial inequity, of deep political division, of declining church involvement, of debilitating mental health issues, of rampant materialism, of overwhelming militarism, of mass incarceration, in light of all these things that are so difficult and challenging, the question we have to ask is this. We have to ask, what does the ministry of Jesus look like in our context? And how do we follow Jesus and continue his story in the midst of of this new reality? Those are questions that, those aren't easy answers, obviously. We like easy answers, and so we don't ask hard questions a lot, you know, because we don't like to come up with hard answers. But these, these are questions that we have to discern, and that's what every Christian in every time and place must discern. What does the ministry of Jesus look like in our current context and reality? And this is what we're trying to do at Embrace. This is what I would call um, what theology ought to be. It needs to be current, but it also needs to be grounded in the ministry and work of Jesus Christ. And if we keep Jesus at the center, then I think we're going to be okay. But keeping Jesus at the center means that we cannot get behind and support things, policies, agendas, movements, whatever, ideas, thoughts that are rooted in racism or hate or division or anything like that. You know, you can see why it might be easier to just not mention Jesus anymore. Because Jesus, he's tough, you know. I sometimes wonder if that's why a lot of churches avoid the Gospels, which a lot of people avoid the Gospels, and they preach almost exclusively from Paul's letters, which Paul's letters are awesome, but I think we've got to be rooted in the Gospels as well. Jesus, but, but Jesus is sometimes just too much. Jesus can be a bit too specific. Jesus can strike to the heart of the matter really well. I think it's way much, it's so much easier to talk about God in general, but it's a bit harder to talk specifically about God revealed to us in Jesus Christ. A general God, this big general God, can bless whatever we want God to bless. But God specifically revealed to us in Jesus, that's another story. That's how it's easy for us in our nation to put in God we trust on our dollar bill, which has actually become an idol. Um, It's idol worship often, what we do with money. And Jesus talks about worshiping uh, mammon and money and wealth, second most to any other topic in the New Testament. Kingdom of God's first, then it's money. And, And we can actually put God's name on the money, the thing that has become the idol, because we've removed Jesus often from the equation. Jesus, the God that has been revealed to us specifically in Jesus Christ, doesn't fit our agendas. You know, the Gospel of John, which we're going to be in this morning, also Matthew, Mark, Luke, they are all about Jesus. And John really wants us to answer this question. He wants to answer this question. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And in his Gospel, we find um, what, what we call I am statements of Jesus, all right? And, and they're all through, these are unique kind of to the Gospel of John. And so here's some that are in there. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And this is Jesus talking. I am the true vine. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. In our text for this morning, we find two more I am statements. And here they are. I am the good shepherd. And I am the gate. All right, and so we're going to get into these uh, this morning. You know, we touched on this a few weeks ago, actually, when we looked at the story of the blind man who was healed by Jesus. If you don't remember, let me remind you about that story. There was a man who was born blind, and as a result, he had been excluded and left out uh, by his family, his friends, his community, and even the religious leaders had left him out and excluded him. They didn't know him. They didn't even recognize him when he was healed. He was on the margins, and he lacked abundant life in community. He didn't have a flock, (laughs) uh, like Sue was talking about. His blindness was all they saw, and as a result, they mistreated him. And Jesus healed this guy, and eventually this man joined Jesus' flock, and he became part of Jesus' community. 
However, his own family failed him, and the religious leaders failed him, and they even kicked him out of the temple and the worshiping community. You see, the religious leaders were supposed to be good shepherds for the people. They were supposed to care for all the people and usher people into a right relationship with God and with others, yet they failed this man. And so Jesus offers up some teaching on what a good shepherd really is. And he actually says, ah, I'm just going to say this, I am the good shepherd, is what he says. And, and he is the one who truly cares for the entire flock. He's like, if you want to know, look at my example. He shepherds the flock with justice, as we looked at in Ezekiel. And so let me read this text from John chapter 10. And, and we're going to break this down just a little bit. So Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, Pharisees. And when you see very truly, I tell you, it's what they call a double amen. It's like, this is important. You need to listen. So he's like, here's what I'm saying, Pharisees. Anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in another way is a thief and a robber. He doesn't he didn't pull any punches, does he? He says, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not uh, understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, there he is. Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Anyone who enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. You know, what we just read there is a parable. All right? And a parable, like I said before, they are mysterious stories with compressed thought. There's many layers of meaning that have been compacted down into a short story. And they are meant to provoke people. Um, they're really meant to provoke, to startle, to cause people to think, to kind of strike at people's like kind of pre-held, pre preconceived notions and these held assumptions that folks have. And this parable is directly related to the story of the blind man. All right, we have a sheep pen in the story, or you could call it a fold, all right? And it was typically a walled-in area next to a home with only one entrance. And so at night, the shepherds would bring their sheep into the fold to protect them. And Jesus says that the true shepherd enters through the gate. The sheep trust him. They know his voice. However, others who are false shepherds, they climb the walls and they try to steal the sheep. And these people don't care about the flock. They're selfish. They're searching for economic gain at the expense of these sheep. And Jesus is implying here, and he's doing it fairly directly, that the religious leaders of his day were thieves and robbers because they abused their power to prop themselves up in a volatile time. We saw this clearly in the story of the blind man and the Pharisees. The true shepherd <clears throat> never do anything to harm his sheep because he loves each of them and he even knows them by name. And he says the sheep are actually going to follow the shepherd because they know their shepherd is good and isn't going to lead them into trouble. So Jesus actually says about himself, I am the good shepherd. In other Gospels, we read about Jesus, the shepherd, leaving the 99 sheep to go and save the one that is lost. That's because the good shepherd loves all the sheep, and he calls them, and he knows each of them by name. This morning, like I said, is the fourth Sunday of Easter. It is traditionally called Good Shepherd Sunday, focusing special attention on Jesus as our good shepherd. And here's the interesting thing that I find is that it's kind of peculiar. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, but he also says, I am the gate for the sheep. So Jesus is the good shepherd that enters the gate, but he also says, I am the gate itself. Let me reread that those verses for you real quick. He says, therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me, 
are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So in the flock of Jesus, life is good. It's not always easy, of course, but Jesus promises us that in his flock we will find abundant, full, awesome life. <laughs> you know, I remember a sermon I heard a while back, many years ago when I was in college, by a guy named Rob Bell, and, and, and I've always liked kind of a lot of the things he's talked about, but he would often say that following Jesus is, he believed, the best life you could possibly live. That this is the best life. You know, we often think of following Jesus as a brutal life, kind of of rules and sacrifice and religious stuff, right? And, and it's just, i got to take up my cross, and it's just brutal and awful, and I can't do anything fun. And, and that's honestly how we often portray it. And, and I go, you know, I, I'm not that confused why young people don't want to go to church often, because the way we present it sometimes sounds pretty bad. But I kind of shifted my thinking back then and started thinking of following Jesus more as abundant life, even as adventure, as something beautiful that is full of meaning and purpose and value. John 10.10 10 is an amazing verse. Jesus said that he came so that all people could find life. And not just any life, but full life. Is, do y'all want full life? Is that something you want for yourself is a full life? That's like a goal of mine is to have a full life. You know, here's a problem that, that I see, and, and I've been guilty of this before. There, there are some of us that, that often sometimes we want church without Jesus. There are many folks that, that want the benefit. They want to benefit a full life and meaning and purpose. They want this life. They want their kids to have religion in their lives. They want the routine and community of church. They like the clear boundaries of belief and religion. Yet sometimes they want all that without Jesus. We want sometimes to get to the community without having to go through Jesus. And Or even worse, sometimes folks actually want to take advantage of the community and the flock uh, to meet their own needs and agendas and aspirations. And, and, and those are the ones that climb in that wall, right, to do harm even to the flock. And, and I've seen this happen in churches before. I'll tell you, it's harder to go through Jesus, the gate, because Jesus doesn't allow exploitation, abuse, harm, hate, if you, if you take Jesus out of the story, then it's a lot easier to do what you want to do. You can exclude the people you want. You can avoid dealing with the hard stuff. You can financially manipulate people. Um, this is how churches were able to put black people in the balconies, you know, because they weren't really, they kind of took Jesus out of the story. And Jesus doesn't allow that. But if you go through the gate, if you go through Jesus... You have to humble yourself. You have to repent. You have to put aside your own agenda. And you have to submit to his way of peace and love and inclusion. I think the church community has to be rooted in Jesus. If we forget the story of Jesus, if we top, stop telling that story, if we stop living that story, then we're going to be like a ship without a rudder. We're going to be like a car without a steering wheel. And we're going to have nothing to guide us. You know, it could be easy to kind of think about a gate as something used to keep people out, right? And, and yes, the gate in this parable does serve one purpose to keep people out who are going to harm the sheep. Um, and, and that's a hard reality sometimes, you know? Like at Embrace, we often say all people are welcome here, but nobody can do any harm to anybody. We're not going to allow that, right? No one can do harm. And so that is part of it. I'll tell you, though, the prominent and the most important meaning of gate in this passage is that the gate is a pathway to abundant life. The gate, which Jesus says he is the gate, is a pathway, 
or is the pathway really to abundant life. The gate opens for those who are longing for life with God and with others. And yes, they have to go through Jesus to get there, but Jesus clearly shows us time and time again that he is open for those who have been excluded and left out, who are struggling. If they're seeking after God and want to submit to his way, then he is open to them, and that gate will open to usher them into the flock of Jesus. And Jesus' vision for the flock, I believe, is inclusive. It is embracing. It is not some exclusive club where Jesus is posted as the bouncer at the door deciding who gets in and who gets out. No, it's an inclusive flock. In the following verses, think about it. Jesus says, I will lay down my life for the sheep so that they might get to his flock. And he didn't say, I'll lay down my life just for my sheep. He says, for the sheep. And then he goes on to say that there are sheep out there that aren't part of his fold, and he's going to have to bring them in also. So all the folks out there, not just the ones who are already with him and part of his flock, no, they're all out there, and he wants to bring them all in. Jesus runs after and pursues the lost and the broken, those who feel unworthy to have abundant life. Those are the ones Jesus is inviting, those suffering from loss, from shame, from hurt. Jesus is the path to life for them. I want to share just briefly um, this interesting kind of observation that I think is kind of fascinating and intriguing that some scholars have pointed out regarding shepherds in the Near East. And I think that what I'm going to share with you is a beautiful depiction of what Jesus provides for his flock. So listen to this story. It's about a man named Sir Adam George or Sir Ad, or Sir George Adam Smith. And I'll just read this. He says, He was one day traveling with a guide and came across a shepherd and his sheep. He fell into conversation with him. The man showed him the fold into which the sheep were led at night. And it consisted of four walls with a way in. And Sir George asked him, Is that where the sheep go at night? Yes, said the shepherd. And when they are in the fold, they are perfectly safe. Sir George was confused, and he commented, But there is no gate, said Sir George. How do you keep them safe if there is no gate? The shepherd looked at him and said, I am the gate. He was not a Christian man. He was not speaking in the language of the New Testament. He was speaking from the Arab shepherd's standpoint. Confused, Sir George looked at him and asked, What do you mean that you're... You are the gate. The shepherd replied, When the light has gone and all the sheep are inside, I lie in that open space to the fold, and no sheep ever goes out but across my body, and no wolf comes in unless he crosses my body. I am the gate. Now, I don't know if that's what Jesus was talking about when he said he is the gate. <laughs> but nonetheless, it is a beautiful picture. And I think it clearly describes what our God is all about, what Jesus is all about. What a beautiful picture of Jesus. Think of Jesus, the good shepherd, lying across the opening to the fold and becoming our gate of protection and salvation and abundant life laying down his life at the entrance to provide that path and that protection. Jesus is both the gate that leads to salvation and abundant life, and he's also the good shepherd that cares and protects his people. If Jesus truly is who he says he is, if these bold claims that he makes about himself, if we really believe they're true, then I don't know why you would want to follow anyone else because this is beautiful what Jesus is offering. And if you know Jesus, which a lot of you do, and you love him, and you believe that he is the way to God and the way to life abundant and to salvation, then, then it's our job to share that with other people because we have something beautiful that we can offer to others, that we can share with them and invite them to be a part of the flock of Jesus. Why on earth aren't we telling others about this? If you are willing to humble yourself, 
right, to enter through the Jesus gate. And I, I believe things can, can change. I believe we can begin to see more life, more abundant life, more full life for all of God's children. This is the word of God for the people of God in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So what we're going to do now is we're going to share communion together. And we're going to worship while we do that. And you can take it whenever you want during this song. Um, you know, so whatever you have, I'd go ahead and find that. I have a, um, a cracker that, that I'm going to use. And, and, and I have a nice chalice here with some juice in it. Um, whatever you have, uh, you can use that. But, you know, that night before Jesus was taken off to his crucifixion, uh, he shared a meal with his disciples. And, and at that meal, um, he took some bread. Um, and, and I have a cracker here, but he broke that and, and he gave it to them and passed it around and said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. And likewise, he took a cup and he said, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And he says, take and drink. And he says, as often as you drink of it, I want you to do this and I want you to remember me. So we're going to share communion this morning. We're going to remember Jesus. We're going to experience his grace, his goodness, and his love. And, and so I, I encourage you as you share um, this with your family or by yourself, wherever you're at, take this seriously and really try to connect with God and with those that you are with. And if y'all bow your heads with me just for a moment. God, we thank you so much for your love and your grace and your goodness. We thank you that you are the good shepherd. We thank you that you are the gate that leads to abundant life and salvation. We thank you that you care for us, that you look after us, that you um, provide um, eternal protection for us. And God, we thank you that you love us desperately. God, we repent and we confess to you that too often we have tried to take you out of the mix and we've wanted to put you in a corner and say that, Jesus, we'll call on you whenever we need you instead of putting you at the center of everything that we are about. Um, we repent that we have done that in our individual lives and in our families. We've done that in our churches. We've done that um, in our communities. Uh, we've done that when we are living our lives at work or wherever we're at. We have just tried to compartmentalize you and we've marginalized you, Jesus. And we repent for that, Lord. And I pray, God, that you would empower us this morning through your presence in this blood, in this uh, juice. Um, and, and in this bread or whatever we're sharing, that through this, Lord, that it would truly be for us the body and blood of Christ, that you would fill us up and empower us to have courage to place you back at the center of everything that we are about. God, you, you are the gate, and, and we don't enter into abundant life without you. <laughs> so God, I pray that you would help us to reprioritize and reorient ourselves this morning around you and your love and your compassion and your goodness and this calling that you've placed upon our lives to join you in your work for, for freedom and for, for love and for compassion and for justice and peace for our world. Lord, we love you so much and we thank you for loving us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to continue to worship, and I encourage you just to take communion whenever you feel ready, ready. And then after we're done worshiping, we'll close out our time together.
Amen. Well, thank you all for being with us this morning. And if you're watching this at another time during the week, then I'm glad that you were able to, to catch what we experienced together this morning. Um, every Sunday we're here together at 11 o'clock. Um, I know that there's been some talk about potentially being able to get back together in person. We're, we're thinking through all that and we'll keep you posted on when and how soon uh, that will happen. And we will certainly be considering what is the best and safest option for all of us um, in the next few weeks. And so we will keep you posted on that. Um, if you could just prepare your hearts to receive the benediction. May the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. Go in God's peace. It's been great to be together. I love you all, and we'll see you next week.